Jo Mardian and you're watching Coffee with Paige. So grab your coffee or tea or whatever it is you drink and settle in because I want to introduce you to our guest for today, Constance Rowe. Hey everyone. <laughs> well now, Constance is really special to me because she is the very first author, speaker to really take me in under her wing uh, when I was working on my first book. And um, so she has just been a really special mentor to me and mm -hmm. friend for several years now. So thank you for coming and hanging out. I love what you're doing. <laughs> I would do anything for you. Oh, well, thank so. you. Okay. Well, you're wearing a really cool shirt right okay. now. So this is my more than a number t-shirt. Um, and I know we'll talk a little bit more at the end about it, but you know, what's interesting is Kellogg's has this more than a number campaign going on oh, right now. Have you heard about it? I haven't. Well, some of you guys probably have. It's been out on the internet quite a lot, but they've done a commercial and their whole theme is what would life be like if you know you knew that you were more than a number, like oh, wow. the size of your clothing. Um, but but I was first. <laughs> they stole it from you. As you well know, Paige yes. helped style me for my More Than A Number music video, which you guys can see at morethanunumber.net. And the idea was to talk about, first of all, for us to know our value, and mm. we'll be talking some about that today, um, and also what can happen when we know our value and how we can change our world. So mm. if you guys go to watch the More Than A Number music video, you'll see two stories a girl from Nashville who thinks that she's fat, you know, mm. fat, and a girl in Kenya who needs to know that she's more than a statistic about poverty mm. or child sex trade, et cetera. And we tie these two together and we talk about what can happen if we really know our value and if we shifted dollars from all the appearance, diet-related stuff mm -hmm. to ending world hunger. So we're partnering with Compassion that is International so cool. on that too. Yeah, so you guys can see all about that at morethanunumber.net. Well, I love, I love what you're doing with that campaign because it's always been interesting to me that, you know, in America and, you know, some places where it's just so image obsessed, mm -hmm. you know, you have people who are starving themselves to uh, meet certain standards of appearance. And yet in so much of the rest of the world, you have people who are starving because they don't have enough food, not because they're image obsessed. And so it's just it's that crazy. weird. Yeah. And I just love that you're kind of bringing the two together. Well, we spend in America, we spend $62 billion a year on diets. Oh my gosh. Okay. Now here's a couple of things about that. So one is we know that most people who go on diets gain everything back plus a few pounds. So we're spending $62 billion on diets and literally the very same amount if it was invested through Compassion International or other organizations like that would literally wipe out worldwide hunger. Wow. So I know that your passion is, you know, wake up generation and, and look at the opportunities that we have. Look at that opportunity. Hmm. Literally, we're throwing money down the drain, the toilet in many cases, um, that could literally end world hunger and we have to take we have to be responsible about that you hmm. know and that's not to say that healthcare and health and wellness is bad but just let's look at you know how we're stewarding what we've been given yeah i think that's that's really important you know there are certainly things you know health wise and whatnot mm -hmm. that we need to take into consideration and but but yeah the the image obsessed mentality often drains rather than you know a more health related mentality it does and i know we've talked about this before but one of the interesting things to me is to when we've we've discussed before i think um, we think that if we can just look perfect people will like us more right yeah. we think that yep but if we think for a minute about who we really feel comfortable around it's usually not the people who look perfect. That's true. Right? And so the lie of Satan has been, perfect yourself because then people will like you. Mm. And what it really does is it causes us to hide ourselves and never feel that love that we're actually going for. That's true. So there's this huge emotional story <laughs> underneath all of that image-related stuff. Yeah. And so being able to talk about that and on, be honest about it with ourselves and with each other can really help people be free and then in turn be healthier. Yeah. Because you're healthier when you're not consumed with all that That's stuff. That's true. Well, yeah. how did you become so passionate about all yes, this? Yes, well, it does come from my personal story. Um, just a little bit of that. And I I have much more in my book, Life Inside the Thin Cage, which I should have brought today to like hold up and show <laughs> you. And I didn't do that. But <laughs> Life Inside the Thin Cage is the title. But um, the short version is that when I was growing up, my mom um, had an eating disorder. 
Okay, mm-hmm. and she had a really violent eating disorder. Uh, there's different types. So anorexia is where people restrict and they don't eat enough food. Um, binge eating disorder is where you, you eat more than you need mm-hmm. consistently. And then bulimia is where you eat a lot and then you either throw up or use laxatives or other things, you know, gotcha. exercise to try and get rid of that. Well, my mom had bulimia. So that one tends to be the craziest of those disorders mm-hmm. because you're eating a lot and then you're getting rid of it and then you feel so ashamed and then you're stressed out and then you eat a lot and then you get rid of it and it becomes this cycle like this. So when I was growing up, I observed her in that behavior and nobody knew what to do with it back then. This was Mm -hmm. the 70s and nobody was dealing with eating disorders. And so she tried the best she could to manage it. Um, Was she, can I ask, was she, you know, kind of was she trying to be quiet about it or was she pretty open about it well, to you? Well, no one with us. Um, what happened was my father, she told my dad, hey, I figured out a way to lose weight by throwing up. Oh, <laughs> like wow. she was young and she thought, this is awesome. You know, I, I can eat anything I want. And if I just throw it up, it, oh, I won't gain no. weight. She just didn't know. People know more today about that. Mm. Um, and so... Uh, he addressed it with her. He actually brought it before the church that they were involved in, and they just said, you need to stop, and she stopped. But it kind of came back. And then she she was very outgoing, very beautiful, very gregarious, whatever. And so she wouldn't necessarily go around telling people she was bulimic, but she was really engaged in that lifestyle. And then she did try to go get help for it. And unfortunately, there just wasn't great help at the time. And so she kept struggling with that. And I remember watching her struggle and just thinking, my mom is so beautiful and Mm -hmm. all the things I just said about her. You know, why would she do this to herself? Mm. I think she's fine the way that she is. And um, my parents ended up getting divorced when I was around 10. Mm. And we stayed with my dad. My mom was kind of ran off and started her own life. And I would go and visit her and I would find her journals and I would read in them what was going on inside of her head. And she was just really trying to figure this bulimia thing out. Mm. And at the time, I'd never worried about my weight. I was never heavy or anything. And I remember just thinking, if I could just shake her and say, do you know what you're doing? Like she would just come out of it. Um, And then when I was 16, I graduated high school early and I went to a Bible college in Texas. And when I did, I found myself really lonely. Um, I didn't, you know, I wasn't good at making friendships with girls. I was kind of overwhelmed being in a new environment, even though I thought I was very independent. And I started binging on food and I didn't know what I was doing, but that was like the only cool thing to do on campus because it was a Christian school and food's Mm -hmm. the only (laughs) allowable thing. (laughs) And so I was eating all of this food and suddenly within two months gained 15 pounds, which people joke about freshman freshman 15. 15. But the freshman 15 typically might happen over the course of a year. And for me, it happened over two months. You know, it was like I was really engaged in eating a lot. And when I realized... Um, that I'd put on that weight, I pretty much freaked out because um, my figure was so important to me. It was the only thing I thought that made me special, that and singing, and those were the two things. And now I felt huge. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, but I felt that way. And so the short story is that as I wrestled through that, um, I was able to get a grip on the binge eating disorder eventually. And then I just was so worried about ever being heavy again that I just was really controlled in my diet for another six or seven years. So really like a decade Mm -hmm. went into all of that. Um, But during that hardest season when it was the craziest for me and I was heavy, heavier than the uh, extra 15, I was much heavier than that. God woke me up in the middle of the night. I was on a singing tour with my college. He woke me up in the middle of the night. We were in Germany and I had this vision, which I don't have these all the time. And I was standing on a stage and I was talking to a college about this issue. It was really weird, but I knew, like I wrote it all down and I thought, oh, I'm I'm gonna do that right away. Um, Then time went by, I got involved in the music business. I had a career and then God began to really deal in my heart. And then he refreshed that vision to me. And by this time I was like 29, but he refreshed me that original vision. And that's when I started finding balance, which was about 11 or 12 years ago now. And today we're the leading Christian resource for daily help with these issues. Mm -hmm. And most of it's media-based stuff. But to be able to do that work that I could have benefited from, that my mother could have benefited Mm -hmm. from, and that so many people can benefit from today has been a a really cool thing. Hmm. Hard, but cool. (laughs) Yeah. Well, what has the healing process been, you know, in your life with these issues? And I say process because we all know it's a process, you know, for all of us with the things that we struggle with. But I mean, what has that been like 
for you and your faith and with just healing? So for me, um, we do say in recovery, it's about progress, not perfection, uh, because it is an ongoing journey. And I don't have an eating disorder today, but I still can wrestle with things that were underlying. So for me, a big piece of it was, um, first of all, admitting I had the problem. I mean, my, and I put this on the back of my book, I don't have an eating disorder. I just watch what I eat Mm -hmm. because I'd gotten so good at just justifying my (laughs) obsession, (laughs) you know, and we all get good at that. Right. So that was step number one was admitting. Step number two was giving God the tiniest little window into it, uh, the tiniest permission. And and mine literally was like this, Lord, I don't want to give this up. I think this makes me happy, but I ask you would help me to be willing to be willing to consider maybe thinking about (laughs) giving this up. Like it really was that small, but it was enough. It was like more than I'd given him. And so he took that, he connected me with a counselor. You know, there's a big question, who do you go to? I didn't know who to go to. And I asked God, please just show me. I don't want to like go through the phone book and just, you know, Mm -hmm. drop my finger on somebody's name. Um, He led me to the right person for me, and I I think he'll do that for anybody. And then working through that with them, then realizing I wasn't as weird as I thought I was, I wasn't (laughs) as bad as I thought I was, you know, all these shame messages that were so internalized inside of myself. Um, And it was an ongoing thing. And a huge thing for me also was getting involved in a recovery group, Hmm. which at the time and this is part of why at Finding Balance we do um, eating issues, recovery group stuff. Um, but nobody was doing that at the time. So I was in a group with uh, drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes, really weird people that were way less good than me. Right? <laughs> That's how I was looking at it, right? I would walk in and I, my pride would say, <sighs> you know, I am not like any of you. And yet there was something about the humility of going and recognizing I'm just the same. Like, we're all connected by our loneliness, our fear, our shame. We're just acting out in different ways. Mm -hmm. So God did really cool stuff through that, which is why at Finding Balance, we're huge proponents of groups and community types of things where you come out of isolation. And then just continuing counseling. I, I told you before we began today that two days ago, I went through an inner healing thing. Again, eating disorder is not a struggle for me today, but shame certainly can be and worrying about what people think about me. And so we targeted that stuff. I had to make time out of my day to go do that. You know, it takes choices, Mm. but making those right choices leads to healthier living. And so that's what I say to anyone. We always say it's only about the next right step. Like you, one thing someone said to me very early on was, you you know, that scripture, your your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Mm. And they said they didn't have spotlights back then. So that lamp into your path was like a little lantern or something that you would care. You would only see the stone right ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, what I love to leave with people is wherever you are and whatever you're wrestling with, it really only takes that one next right step. And God knows what that step is. Mm -hmm. And you just got to reach out and ask him to lead you to what it is and then take it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then you'll see what the next one is. That's so good. Well, just as we wrap up, just what is, you just shared some great advice for people who may be going through this, but What's something that is just burning on your heart that that is really kind of the core of what you try and convey when you speak to people? Yeah, uh, that's hard to narrow down, (laughs) as you can probably tell I talk a lot. I'll tell you what I'm learning right now, as of two days ago. Sounds good. (laughs) Which is, there can be parts of our lives that, that we've invited Jesus into, and then there can be parts of our lives that don't know Jesus. That sounds crazy. And I would have said two days ago that that's crazy, but what I'm learning is, There can be parts of us, say our independent self or our controlling self or whatever, that has not invited Jesus in there Mm -hmm. because we don't, why? Because we don't trust him, Mm -hmm. really. Like that's the part, the perfectionistic part or whatever. I'm going to do that on my own. And so we can have this sort of fragmentation sometimes within ourselves where we sort of believe in Jesus enough for me to do years worth of ministry and tell people about him. Mm but to not fully trust him with these parts that we think maybe he would not understand or he would not do well with. That's so and good. so, yeah, so wherever you guys are with that today, you know, if, just maybe ask God, is there a part of me that doesn't know you? <laughs> that sounds weird, but it really can happen. There can be a part of us that doesn't really know him or certainly doesn't invite him into that part of who we are and that aspect of our lives. And mm-hmm. so 
that's what I'm learning right now. And so, so I good. always talk about what I'm learning right now. And, and that's, I'm going to be chewing on that one for a little while. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the point of total surrender. Okay, Lord, right. so I've given this part to you, but, but what about this part and this part? Yeah. Just Lord, I'll lay myself at your feet. And knowing that he actually loves those parts too. Yeah. Because for me, it was like, those parts are bad, mm. right? He, you know, we'll keep those over here. Yeah. So knowing that he loves all of it, yeah. all of you and yeah. all of me and all of you. So yeah. that's, that's a big thing to sort of believe, yes. but it's true. Well, thank you, yes. Constance. You're so wonderful. And I've just loved our friendship over the years. You're always such an encouragement to be real and get real <laughs> <Yeah>. to me. <laughs> and uh, I'm just so grateful for your friendship. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so fun to have you and thank you, Constance. And we'll see you next Tuesday on the next Coffee with Paige.